Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Mind the Air Gap uh, talk. Thank you for waking up so early. So, my name is Pedro Mblino. I'm a senior security researcher at Checkmarks. Uh, there's my contacts there, email, IRC, Twitter. Um, my main responsibility at uh, Checkmarks research team is to research whatever I want, which is pretty cool. Uh, so I have to thank uh, Erez Yalon for that. Uh, it's a great team to, to be working on. So what's this talk going to be about? So I'm going to talk about air gap, air gap cover channels, uh, data exfiltration methods, some examples of what's been done, the research that has been done in the past and, and now. And I'm going to present, hopefully, two live demos about uh, NFC and uh, Bluetooth low energy smart bulbs. And let's see how it goes. So why this need to research into air gaps? So nowadays you see that organizations uh, and buildings have increased their security. There are more and more high security environments. Uh, so there's this need to uh, investigate into new data exfiltration techniques. Um, this could be out of uh, the need to have a low fingerprint or have uh, stealthy requirements. So there's these new techniques to exfiltrate data that are not detectable by current uh, intrusion detection systems or, or needs. Uh, this can also be a method to uh, evade or bypass low permissions. For example, there's some malware that's inside the system that cannot use, uh, let's say, the Ethernet card or the or the Bluetooth card. But there are still some things that the hardware can control, like the access to the hard drive and make a LED blink, for example, and use that as a channel to exfiltrate data. Uh, and it's extra challenging. It's really fun to, to do this kind of research. I think it speaks to the heart of what a hacker actually does in the ways that it subverts the system and is, a, is able to control and have an effect, sometimes a physical effect on the real world. And you see in the examples, for those who are not familiar with the topic, that Hollywood has nothing on us. There are some examples that are pretty, uh, pretty far out. So, boring part first. So what's an air gap? So air gap is a measure or a set of measures that uh, ensures that a secure computer or system is sep physically separated for, from an unsecure network. So the, the name arises from this conceptual air gap that exists between the, the two secure and unsecure networks. So in theory, the concept represents the maximum security that uh, a, a network can have from one another. Of course, this is just theory. It's, it's a, a theoric concept. It's very hard to implement. Um, applications where air gapping are seen most often are military or government uh, computer networks and systems, some financial computer systems, some very industrial control systems like nuclear power plants, medical equipment, aviation, and SCADA systems, etc. So the definition for a cover channel could be defined as an unintentional channel that is used to transmit or receive data between systems in which air gapping me measures are taking uh, place. So what I mean by an intention, an intentional is that the channel was not originally designed to uh, transmit or receive data, but it's still used in that way. Although there might be some additional uh, software um, uh, needed at the target system, uh, usually there's no hardware uh, modifications at all. Uh, it's not like to bridge an air gap that uh, an attacker goes and plugs in, for example, a, a USB Wi-Fi card and then it bridges the air gap like that. It's kind of a, a cheat. Uh, so, cover channel supports for, for air gap. Uh, there's physical media. For example, Stuxnet used the uh, USB stick to infect uh, air gap networks and then uh, gathered all the information and recorded back to, to a hidden uh, uh, file system in the USB pen and then exfiltrated the data out. So that's a, a physical support for, for uh, an air gap cover channel. There's also acoustic uh, supports. Uh, the, a computer can generate noise not only using the, the sound card, but also the computer fan, for example. Uh, there's also light supports where uh, a malware can blink uh, uh, an LED or a computer screen, for example, and use that as a support to exfiltrate data. Seismic. Uh, nowadays, smartphones have uh, vibrations and vibration sensors that can be used, also magnetic, 
thermal system, thermal supports, electromagnetic supports. There's a wide range of supports that can be used. Uh, I think imagination is, is the limit for, the, for this. So let's look at, at some real world uh, examples. So it's hard to talk about uh, uh, the air gapping uh, theme without talking, going back a bit uh, to the Tempest area. Uh, and talk about Vanek freaking. In 1985, Vanek uh, discovered that uh, CRT monitors emit uh, radiation that is found very similar to uh, television transmissions. So we set up an antenna and figure out a way to, just by pointing an antenna to a CRT screen, to actually decode what's on that screen. And he did it from 200 meters away. Uh, later on, Marcus Kuhn was able to do it with LCD screens also. So there are many examples. We, we cannot go through them all because I won't, won't have time for the demos. Uh, but some, some known ones are cool ones like Lottery and Unpress uh, devised a, a malware in 2002 that uses the caps lock blinking at a very uh, fast rate and he w they were able to exfiltrate data out of the LED from the caps lock uh, light. Sound emissions. Uh, Ants, Pass, and Goats in 2013 created an acoustic mesh network where the computers used only the sound card and the microphone to implement a network. So the computers didn't have to have a Wi-Fi or an Ethernet card to communicate between themselves. They only use the sound cards. Now, state of the art. If you go to search this topic on Google, Nowadays, it's almost impossible to not be referred to the Ben Gurion University. So they are they are doing uh, a lot of crazy research. For example, GSMEM. Uh, everyone, uh, anyone has heard about GSMEM? GSMEM is a, a software that uses uh, executed uh, executes memory instructions, memory move instructions, which actually turn your laptop into a GSM station. So the, the frequency that they get executed emanates uh, electromagnetic radiations and turns your laptop into a GSM station, which can be picked up by a cell phone. They did the same with Air Hopper. Uh, Air Hopper turns your computer into an FM transmitter that you can pick up on your radio and exfiltrate data that way. They use uh, USB. They turn the USB bus into an antenna. Uh, by executing several USB commands. Uh, the principle is the same, generate some electromagnetic perturbance that can be picked up by a, by a receiver. Um, Trauma Schammer and Genking in 2014 devised an acoustic crypto a side channel attack, which they used a ultrasonic uh, microphone directed at a computer, and they were able to pick the ultrasonic noises that the capacitors on the motherboard do when they are decoding some kind of information. So they were able actually to extract an RSA key just by measuring ultrasonic noise on the capacitors of a motherboard. <laughs> Which is pretty cool. Uh, Bitwhisper. Uh, I'm going to tell you about this one. So. Uh, at Ben Gurion University, they did a demo also, which is, uh, was pretty cool. So they infected uh, a printer scanner, a uh, multifunction printer scanner. And they, they devised, uh, they, they, they built a drone with a laser and a high resolution camera. So what they did was they used, they used the, la the, the laser from the drone. The drone was like one kilometer away, firing a laser into a building where the printer scanner was. And the scanner would turn on and uh, receive the laser, uh, was able to perceive that the laser was being shined on the room. So you have a downlink channel. And then blinked is a, a LCD screen. And the camera on the drone picked up the, the blinking. So you have an uplink channel. And they used the printer scanner to pivot in the network of the building. It's pretty nice. So there are a lot of examples. There's no time to go through all of them. but. Uh, they're pretty cool. So, so now I'm going to talk about uh, the data exfiltration research that we have been doing. So this is a tale. This is a light bulb tale. So I like to research stuff, uh, random stuff. Sometimes it's even security-related stuff, which is cool. Uh, it turns out that I'm not alone. Uh, David Sopas, which is a colleague of mine, shares the same illness. I'm pretty sure uh, most of you also share the, this illness. And David is nowadays researching a lot into IoT devices, 
And that's when he's not overseeing a bunch of crazy researchers like myself. Uh, some months ago, he told me that he had a light bulb. He wants to hack into this light bulb and the story begins like that. Uh, so the plan A is always get root, right? Uh, he was not able to get root. There were some uh, issues. There was not enough time also. But uh, he, he was still able to do something. He was able to control the light itself on, on a light bulb, which is over there. So it's a, a RGB light bulb. Uh, so we were very surprised to see that there was no authentication at all in the light bulb. Everybody can control it. So there's, there's this basic uh, Bluetooth low energy security fails that uh, if you go into BLE, you know. So the process begins with uh, enumeration, uh, endpoint enumeration, then figure out which characteristics in, in the light bulb were able to be written to, reversing the Android application to figure out the communication protocols and which uh, codes control which channel on the light bulb and so forth. And then you have uh, RGB color set uh, at your disposal. So this is about the time when he called me and said, okay, I, I, I have no more ideas, what can we do with this? And I, I immediately thought, okay, let's implement an air-gapped cover channel exfiltration to a light bulb. And he said, okay. So, so what's, the, what's our idea for implementation? So the, the transmitter was implemented using a simple scheme just by changing the blue light intensity on the bulb. Uh, it's a little bit weaker for binary one, a little bit stronger for binary zero. Uh, the blue channel, we chose it because the human eye has more issues uh, distinguishing between the different uh, shades of blue. It's just how our, our eyes work. Uh, so the, the protocol is really simple, just sends a preamble, then a byte, then a trailer. And we chose to, to cycle the, 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 the colors in a slow manner because we wanted to use off-the-shelf components for the receiver. So. If the if it changes uh, in a slow manner, you can use the camera from any smartphone to receive that information, and you don't have to device some kind of sensor uh, to have a high-speed data exfiltration. So our idea is always to use low-cost, off-the-shelf solutions that you can uh, actually replicate at home to to the POCs. So this is the tech scenario. Let's imagine that. Uh, uh, this device has been compromised by malware, and the malware steals user credentials. So the malware wants to leak this information, uh, but the attacker has, wants to do it in a stealthy way or cannot use other resources like the, the Wi-Fi or Ethernet card or GSM or wh whatever reason the attacker chooses to, he wants to use a more uh, stealthy way. Also, Bluetooth low energy doesn't have uh, a very uh, long range and light when it's shine on uh, on a room can be picked up by a longer uh, by a longer distance so the attacker uses the the bluetooth to scan for nearby lamps it discovers the vulnerable lamp and uses that lamp to exfiltrate data out uh the attacker on the receiver end uh just has to point his device his smartphone to to some area that's illuminated by the lamp uh, this is a very uh, close setup that that I have here for, for the demo. Uh, let's try to make it work. First, I'm going to turn on the lamp. Hopefully, it turns on. So, the, the, this is the receiver device. It has only has to, it does not have to point to the lamp, just to an area that's illuminated. Let's pretend this is uh, two kilometers apart and there's a telescope here. I actually did that with a telescope and it works pretty well. Uh, so, demo time. Yeah. So this is the the, the infected device, which will be running uh, the malicious code. So first I'm going to to demonstrate how does it look without the stealth part on. So uh this is a, a light just blinking. There's there's not the, the blue channel implementation is not in this version. Uh so you can see. Um this might not be a problem if you are exfiltrating data out of a place that there's nobody there or, or there's nobody seeing, it might not be a problem. Hopefully 
when you click the start button, button here. Uh, Hopefully, the program will start to decode the, the information if the light is blinking. So, Murphy is playing tricks on me again. It's okay. I have a video demo also for this, but I, I wanted to show. So, the problem here is that there are uh, a gazillion Bluetooth-enabled devices in this room, and the software sometimes has uh, trouble finding the, the camera. So uh, the information that we are trying to exfiltrate is uh, what? W00T. And you can see on the bottom left that it's already started to pick up the, the word. 00T uh, exclamation mark. So, this is without the stealth mode. So now, now I'm going to try and, and use the stealth mode to see if, if you can find, if you can uh, notice any difference in the blue light. So it's connecting now. And it's trying to connect to, to the light bulb. Sorry for this boring part. There's no other way to do it except video. So what 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 going what's going to happen is that uh, it, the 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 software is going to change just a slight variation of intensity in the blue channel, and the the receiver part will try to adapt. So it measures all col colors channel. It filters the images to a to a grid and extracts the blue channel, uh, makes an average of the colors that's seen, that determines the maximum color and minimum uh, intensity, so it can auto-adapt to any intensity and variations in, in light, even during daylight. So this is a theory. In practice, sometimes it's a bit harder. Yeah, it's trying to decode something, oh, but not very successful. I, I can show a video later if you have time. Also, after the talk, uh, I'm available, and I'll, I'll do the demos. Uh, if you want to talk to me, I'll do the demos too, so you can see. So, first failed. The penguin was not enough. So, so I'm going to tell you another tale. This is about Android. So, Android, yeah. Damn it. Sorry about that. So I'm going to tell you another tale about Android. So as I said, I like to research a lot of stuff, different stuff, and my overlords are awesome. So uh, one of the things that uh, I wanted to research was a particular brand of Android devices. Uh, the audit turned out not to be so profitable in terms of uh, bugs that I found, so I moved on in, into a full Android uh, OS uh, audit. At the, at the point in time, it was an Android uh, 6.0. I've done that before with some success, so I, I know what I was going to look for. Uh, I usually look for uh, permission bypass mechanisms or some logic errors, some logic bugs, and not the traditional bugs. And I look for opportunity to make the device uh, behave in ways that are not expected. So during this audit, I found this package called NFC adapters and a function called enable reader mode. We'll get back to that. I'm just going to talk a bit about NFC really fast. So NFC stands for near field communication, as you might know. And it's a set of communication protocols that enable two electronic devices uh, to talk to one another if they are really close. So really close because the, the, pro the, the NFC involves always an initiator and a target. And usually this target uh, is passive, has no batteries. So it has to be quite close to the initiator to use the energy trans of the transmission uh, to process whatever it has to process and reply back. 
So uh, it operates on the radio frequency of 13.56 megahertz, and uh, usually a device can be a, a, a smartphone, can be a, a reader or a writer, can be configured as different uh, operating modes. The modes just concern uh, modulation methods, coding schemes, and protocol initialization uh, processes. So back, back to the NFC adapter class. So while I was doing the audit, uh, I noticed that there was no uh, protection in this particular function. So when, when you use Android, for those who have Android, they know you have to uh, give permission uh, when, when uh, an application wants to use certain resources on, on your phone, like, like the Wi-Fi card or like the NFC, for example. And I noticed all functions were protected by NFC permissions, but not this particular function for some reason. So I was curious. I wanted to know what this function does. Uh, was, what is it for? Um, so what I, what I did was I set up the uh, software-defined radio and turn on the, the NFC on, on my phone and just analyze what's going on. And what's going on is that when NFC is turned on, there's uh, the, 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 car, the radio card is configured for a normal, uh, usually type A pooling, which means that your device uh, is always sending uh, a packet, so to speak, is always sending a pulse of energy, trying to figure out if there's some uh, passive device nearby, like a smart card. Uh, or like the card that you use to enter your door in this hotel, for example, it's, N it's NFC. So I discovered that uh, I, I visualized the different modes of operation uh, with the software-defined radio, uh, because that's what that function does. That function allows uh, an application to uh, configure the, N the NFC radio, even that if you know, don't have permissions, you don't have to have permissions to configure the radio. And what I figure out is that when you, when you change the mode of operation to NFC type F or NFC type A, what the device does, it immediately starts to pull. It, changes, it, it configures itself for this new mode and immediately starts to pull for new cards nearby. Uh, and there's this special kind of, of operation mode which, call, which is called skip and left check, which makes the, the, the radio card go silent. So the NFC does not pull anymore. So this gave me an idea, of course. So what if you can cycle through these modes really fast? Uh, what will happen? And do you see any problem here? So what's happened is then you get this NFC controllable bursts. You're not using NFC per se. You're not using uh, functions uh, of the NFC library uh, to transmit NFC data in the traditional way. You're just turning on and off the NFC radio. And this results in a burst of energy because it's the NFC card trying to pull for, for, for smart cards around. So the timing is not completely controllable because uh, it happens on the background on the phone. You don't have uh, real time. Uh, control about it, but it's close enough to to think and implement a data exfiltration method via these bursts. So on-off keying was the uh, uh, immediate idea, like burst, no burst. So the implementation that I did is that uh, the, a radio burst stands for binary one, a silence for bi binary zero. It's the simplest forms of uh, amplitude shift keying, uh, OO key. So the, the protocol is a bit more complicated. I, I wanted to add uh, Emming 7.4 correction codes for the transmissions because there's a, usually a lot of noise, uh, and I wanted to be able to receive that data properly. Uh, and this is the transmission part. So the transmitter is just your device that has been uh, compromised by malware. Uh, I, we also uh, tried some, some, uh, some NFC uh, USB tags uh, they're also interesting. So, but this is the emitter. So, how can we receive this signal? Do we use uh, SDR decoding? Do you code uh, GNU radio? Uh, do you use cost custom hardware? Well, if you remember 13.56 megahertz, this is also called high frequency band uh, or short waves. So, if you buy one of those expensive radios, you, you can uh, actually uh, receive the signal. But also, if you buy a very inexpensive radio that uh, supports for shortwave, usually uh, almost all AM radios do, uh, you can receive these this, this, uh, waves. So I coded the receiver as an Android app, 
that's connected uh, via the mic jack just to a standard, very cheap radio. So you can use that, the, the, the radio receiver and you have a, a practical low-cost receiver with off-the-shelf components. Again, our main target to, to do this, this kind of research. So now you end up with an ultra-long-cost, long-range NSC data exfiltration uh, mode. So, long-range. Uh, NSC stands for near, right? It turns out that, no. Uh, if you remember about the pooling process, the initiator has to send uh, some sort of signal. That signal cannot be weak because you have to power up a, a passive device. The passive device has to use that energy and then has enough energy to reflect back and still be readable. So it's sort of a strong signal. And we are thinking about data exfiltration one way. We are not thinking about making NFC work. We are like we're not trying to make the normal NFC protocol to work, we're just using NFC and we are trying to detect the existence of an NFC pooling process. This is important. Uh, so we got more than four centimeters, which is the, the standard uh, uh, distance for a, a car to work. How much more? Uh, any estimates? No. So. We got successfully detected NFC over 40 meters uh, distance just using a standard radio. Not a very expensive radio, just a standard radio, no, no dedicated e equipment whatsoever. Uh, if we are talking about US, uh, USB NFC dongles, we can detect that over 100 meters of distance. So NFC used like this is definitely not short range. So the attack scenario is quite similar to to the attack that I showed you. So there's this uh, compromised device that has no permissions or does not use the, the, does not want to use the standard ways to exfiltrate data out. So it uses NFC on the device because it has a NFC chipset and on the, on the, the attacker on the receiver end just has an unconspicuous AM radio connected to his smartphone and he's able to decode information out of it. So now for the demo. If you bear with me just a bit. So this is the, the attacker. The application is called NFC Drip. Uh, the plan is to open source it and, and uh, then you can play around with it. So this is the emitter part. I'm just going to put it here. Unplug this. And let's see if it works. So do you have an image? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to use one of these radios here, which is the cheapest ones I could I could find for, for for this demo. I also have an expensive one that will allow you to listen to to the NFC signals. Uh it was not very smart to try to do this demo because I, I wasn't aware that this building is controlled, everything is controlled via NFC, so there's a lot of noise. I'm, I'm going to show you the amount of noise that there is. This is supposed to be static. Can you listen? Okay, so let's see what Murphy has for us. So I connect to the to the mic jack. I start the receiver. I power the radio on. It's just a standard radio. Start listening. And hopefully when I start the emitter here, it starts to send data and you can see some spikes uh, coming out and it will start to decode whatever it wants to decode, which should be password. Okay. Maybe if I just... I cannot put the antenna too much out. It's secret password with uh, uh, trees instead of E's. So it's detecting some errors, but uh, it's mainly able to be to correct them, at least some of them. 
So you see the secret secret password coming out, and the demo gods were appeased this time. Awesome. So this is a short distance. It's around uh, one meter and a half, but it's enough for you to see that it's not four centimeters, like they say. Uh, in a cleaner environment, you can you can use a, a much longer distance. As I said, we we tried with uh, also the USB sticks. Uh, we haven't have enough time to 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 map out all the uh, NFC radio chips that are that there are, and I'm pretty sure that they have uh, different different uh, dif different capabilities and ranges. Um, there are some caveats, like um, the the type of NFC uh, antenna. This, just a second. So, the uh, the NFC's antennas are are uh, a round coil, and this uh, usually round or square coil, and this has some characteristics that may, makes it a bit directional. So, if you want longer range, you have to be in the right direction uh, uh, because the signal is highly directional. Um, also, if you want to make uh, antennas for 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 this kind of of uh, signal, uh, it, it, it's a bit harder. You cannot use like a standard bipole because it will measure around uh, 11 meters, I think, uh, for this wave band. So you have to have uh, ele uh, elicoidal antennas or other kinds of antennas. I'm not an expert on antennas or transmissions. This uh, was just an experiment. Uh, so, still. Conclusions. So, to win that will, ways are not wanting. So, I think the main point here is that uh, imagination knows no boundaries. Uh, if if a device is connected, and there's uh, there's always be ways, and there will always be people trying to get a data out of that device or trying to break into that device. And just because someone tells you that. Uh, technology works in a particular way doesn't mean that's implemented that way. It just means that people, when they thought about it, they wanted to do it that way. Uh, so the IoT, of course, brings extra challenges to security and also comes into effect this air gapping processes and mechanisms. It makes no sense to have a completely secure building with, you know, conductive ink to block from RF signals if you allow for your employees to bring a light, a BLE enabled light bulb, uh, into the office and because they think it's cool. Uh, and last but not least, I, uh, the statement here is that the NFC should no longer be considered a short-range channel. It can uh, effectively be uh, implemented a, a long-range data exfiltration channel using uh, NFC, using low-cost equipment also. And uh, that's it. So, <laughs> questions? Any questions in the room? People still not waking up properly yet. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, well, experiment with the rest of the hotel. Yeah, sure. You can maybe report back later on what you're finding. Yeah. Please feel free to, to reach me uh, if you want a more close-up demo. Uh, I wanted to show the, the, the light bulb also working, but I had no time. Thank you. Thank you.